you see I, this more as a truce than a substantial trade agreement? Well, uh, anything that reduces trade uncertainty is better than not doing it. And so this is better than doing nothing. Uh, but it's not a serious agreement. What really happened here? The, uh, the next round of tariffs was deferred. We don't know for how long. The Chinese agreed to buy a rather modest amount of U.S. agricultural products. We don't know over what period. And we also know that it hasn't been finally agreed. So uh, it's not, as Larry Summers just said very ably, uh, it's not really a serious agreement. I would add, though, that it's consistent with the discussions that we've had on this show a few times in recent months, because I tried to observe that the president would not go into an election year uh, with a full-blown trade dispute or war with China, and he wouldn't do that because he wouldn't want the downward pressure on the economy that that is, has been creating and would be continuing to create, and he wouldn't do it because it isn't consistent with his self-styled self -styled, self dealmaker image. So uh, I remember coming here and saying a couple of times there would be some type of papered over interim agreement, and that's what we just saw. Do you think we get more than this, though? Does that satisfy his uh, dealmaker persona ahead of the election, or is this kind of what we can expect going into 2020? I don't know whether they will be able to do more than this. Uh, probably unlikely, because do you see any structural reform here? Do you see any uh, enforceable commitments on the treatment of intellectual property or on the Chinese approach to mandated technology transfer or on state-sponsored hacking uh, or things like that? The answer is no, you don't. So there's no structural reform in here. And I think we're, that the two sides are very, very long way from that. In fact, I'm pretty pessimistic that that's actually going to happen anytime soon. So whether they do, whether the president has another little deal up his sleeve uh, between now and the election, I don't know, it wouldn't surprise me, but not a big one. Uh, although the president, as you know, did say that this morning, I think he said this is the greatest, something like the greatest deal in the history of the world or, or the history of the universe or the solar system or something like that. <laughs> and speaking of deals, I mean, you speak with uh, CEOs in the boardroom, you know, all across the world as your job at Evercore. Uh, there was a new report by Baker McKinsey which said that uh, M&A value will slump globally from $2.8 trillion in 2019 to $2.1 trillion in 2020. Uh, a lot of that is blamed on the uncertainty as it relates to the trade war. Uh, so do you see agreements like this in, in principle as being enough to, to lift that uncertainty and uh, create more M&A uh, into 2020? Well, first of all, I think the fundamentals uh, that drive M&A volumes remain pretty good. Ultra low interest rates, robust credit availability, high equity valuations, and at least in the United States, uh, good levels of business confidence. And the United States remains the strongest M&A market in the world. So I don't think the trade uncertainty is the biggest reason or a huge dark cloud over M&A volumes. I think there's a lot of other aspects of uncertainty. I mean, the other, other than the U.S. and other than China and, say, Australia, the world is slowing down, as the incoming chief of the IMF just observed in her maiden speech. Uh, and that's not positive. Uh, and obviously, an election year creates its own uncertainty. Uh, and, and there'll be uh, a, lot, a lot of continuous debate about that. But I think the fundamentals remain pretty good. And volumes are off a little, as you say, but they're not off dramatically. So we'll see. Are tariffs here to stay, the ones that are in place right now? Because if they are, and we should hunker down for them to be here for the longer term, and you're going to see, and you see potentially more companies making more plans to shift their supply chains permanently, it seems like there is some certainty in that. Well, I, I think one of the uh, uh, real problems that's on the horizon is whether the world is going to evolve into two uh, technology spheres, so to yeah. speak, China and its immediate allies and the rest of the world, and, uh, and that, and that on, the, on the U.S. side and the Western side, uh, there'll have to be uh, complete uh, independence from China from a supply chain point of view and other points of view. I fear that that's the way we're headed, and the Huawei dispute really illustrates that. I hope we aren't, but I think we may be headed there, and that would be negative. Finally, Roger, a uh, couple tactical calls from analysts today, macro strategists saying cyclical stocks could do well at the end of the year. reason I'm asking is it's based on 
a, finally a little crack in the dollar as we get close to year end. Do you think that's possible? Well, I think it's possible, but for a slightly different reason. Um, you know, we're in the third, what our economist Ed Hyman calls, mini recession since 2010. We had one in 2013, a slowdown. We had one in 2017. We're having one now. But it isn't likely to lead to a recession, and we may see a little pickup on growth. Uh, and you can see the yield curve perhaps signi signifying a pickup and certain other things. So I think there may be a pickup toward the end of the year. I'm not sure the dollar is a big factor in that, but we may see that pickup nevertheless.